going to change things up a little bit tonight and get started in our service. And uh, we're just going to do um, two congregationals, okay? And then we've got uh, two special singings tonight. Glad everyone was able to make it back. Uh, I'm say you probably ran into some uh, heavy storms uh, on the way to church tonight. Uh, me and Haley dodged them. Uh, we, we, we made it fine, but there was some bad stuff that hit in front of us and then evidently hit, hit behind us. But uh, tickled for everyone that was able to come out, be back with us tonight. Those that's tuning in on live stream, uh, we welcome you. Let's stand up and take the church hymnal tonight. Turn to page number 92. Page 92. this one from what I gave Andy. He may know this song, may be new to him, I hope not. Page 57 in your church hymnal. Uh, I'm not sure he, if he knows that one, he can, he can try to hang with us.
as we're singing this last one, be a real good time to practice what you just made me preach last Sunday night, okay? And let's kind of intermingle, maybe this side, make it all the way over to this side, shake hands, fellowship with each other. They may be a seat empty next week, amen? So let's take this time of fellowship. Now, you can sing. Don't leave me up here doing solo. I'll get mad and quit. You, you can walk and sing. You know the song. So let's sing this last verse in fellowship. times I look out and see it raining like it was raining a little while ago at the house. I think, what if it did that for 40 days? My, my, my. The fountains of the deep were broken up. Everest is 29,000 and 29 feet, and it covered it. Amen. Y'all go ahead and be seated. Say, do you believe in a universal flood, preacher? Yes, sir. The entire earth was covered with water. Not just a local job. The whole earth. Certainly do. All right, well, good to have you, folks. Hey, man, I know the weather's been, been an issue, and they gave a tornado warning for Campbell County and areas north of us. I hope nobody got all messed up tonight with this thing. So uh, just pray and thank the good Lord for what he's done for us. Our evangelist is here tonight. Hey, man, and we're glad to have him. You want anybody visiting with us tonight first time? Don't see any, but that doesn't mean anything. All right, well, good to be here. Hey, man, we're meeting in Wednesday night, 7 o'clock for a prayer meeting. And y'all keep that in mind. I don't know. We got enough here to have a uh, take up an offering? <laughs> y'all come on up here and we'll, we'll take up an offering tonight. That's the only way you know for sure, sure you're in a Baptist church. Amen. <laughs> How many of you know what an indulgence is? A lot of you do, don't you? That's what Martin Luther got some mad over. Amen. Back in the 1500s. Father, thank you, Lord. Meet in your house tonight. Bless your word and bless the preaching of Scripture. Your holy name. Amen.
Melanick and Shelly Lee are going to sing for us tonight. timeless thing earth and heaven will pass away it's not a dream God will make things all new that day gone is the curse from which I stumbled and fell evil is banished to eternal hell no more night no more pain no more tears never crying again and praises to the great I am we will of that risen land. See over there, there's a mansion prepared for me, where I will live with my Savior eternally. No more night, no No more tears, never crying again, and praises to the great I am. We will live in the light of that risen Lamb. See all around, now the nations bow down. To sing, the only sound is to praise us to Christ our King. Slowly the names from the book are read. I know the King, so there's no need to dread. No more night, no more pain, no more tears, never crying again, and praises to the great I am, we will live in the light of the I'm going to sing my testimony song. It's Roger and I's testimony song. And I thank the Lord for saving me, for dying for me. Those out there streaming and watching this, I want you to know it doesn't matter where you've been. God loves you. And he loved me. I've been in and out of juvenile. I ran away from home. I was on TV. My mom and dad was trying to find me. Instead of going through anything deep, what happened in my life, I was at the bottom. <laughs> but God reached down and saved a little girl like me. And this song, it just means so much to me because God did. And I thank the Lord. And those that are out watching, I want you to know there's always hope. There are people praying for you that love you. And there's always, always somebody praying. And all you have to do is call on God's name. Those that are depressed, I'm telling you, we have a better place to go. We have a great big God. A great big God.
came to the cross in the ranks of my sin. I was wretched and vile, lost and lonely within. God came just in time when I needed a friend. He put my life back together again. God did. God did. God put my life back together again. A life that was broken and ruined by sin. He put my life back together again together again I've made a new start <laughs> Jesus has taken first place in my heart now gone is the pain that I felt deep within for he put my life back together again. God did, God did, God put my life back together again. A life that was broken and ruined by sin. He put my life back together again. God put my life back together again. I'll tell you the truth, and that's good. The Lord's done that for millions of people, folks, and he still can. Brother Greg Lynch going to preach tonight. That's a good message this morning from Second Chronicles 7.14. Amen. And I agree with everything that he said. Yes, sir. Let me turn this on for you. Put it up here. Check, check, check. There we go. All right. Thank you so much for being in God's house tonight. And... Um, we were trying to get here, and some of the back roads that it was taking me, there was trees down, and so we had to turn around one time, and then when we got uh, right up here coming on to Highland, uh, there was another tree down. It fell across somebody's house or car uh, that was right there, and uh, so y'all had some pretty tough storms uh, throughout the afternoon. I was watching uh, the radar and watching different things as it was going through Harriman, different locations around the area. And so I think it got through Rockwood and Harriman and all that okay. And uh, so a lot of different lo locations that were affected. And uh, anytime there's storms like that, uh, it, I remember when the tornado hit Mississippi, uh, we were actually at the hotel. We were at Crown College doing a Connect event, and uh, we were sitting at the hotel and uh, they said that this area of Mississippi is about to get uh, pounded with a large tornado. And uh, sure enough, it came through and they were describing it as it went. And uh, I called uh, my wife's uh, cousin, that pastor's there, and I said, what do you need? I said, I know I just seen on the screen uh, that it demolished some of the areas near there. And so we were able to take a load of supplies and go down to uh, Mississippi and help the folks there and we are still uh, there just now and that was probably six eight months ago uh, or, or a year ago now and they are just now bringing in the FEMA trailers for the people to live in so it's always a long process it's nothing short uh, in the time frame of any major disaster like that and I remember going to that community and it looked like a saw had cut the houses in half and everything was gone, demolished, and uh, we went in there and began to help those folks. And so now what we're doing 
is a new project that we've taken on is to try to supply the FEMA trailers so when they move those families in, they already have linens in them, washcloths, towels, blankets, all the stuff, then food and things like that that we supply those trailers with that enables those families to move in and everything will be there for them. So another new project that we started this year trying to help in that situation uh, with uh, that. And plus it gives uh, uh, those churches in the area, it gives us a way to outreach to those new families moving into those FEMA trailers so that way uh, they can try to get them in church. So it's always, everything should be centered around the gospel, trying to reach people, uh, trying to be a blessing to them, help them uh, in these situations and circumstances. So uh, you continue to pray for us, pray for hearts with hands. And uh, let me mention this, uh, as we are preparing for uh, hurricane season to start, that always starts the 1st of June and usually goes to the middle of November. And uh, depending on the storm season, I have been working storms up until Christmas, uh, depending on what the situation is with those storms and things of that nature. So pray for us as we're preparing for that. And then pray for us as we are trying to get the camp put back together uh, we need churches like this that would help us, that would sponsor that. Uh, it's cost thousands of dollars to put those roofs back on and get all of that put back together. And one of the things that we have been working on, that camp is right on the evacuation route of Florida, right on 75. And so we're making that a evacuation center so when they come out of Florida, we can bring those families to that location. We already have a place to sleep them, feed them, and, uh, and have a tabernacle to meet and have church in. And uh, so it's going to be a great opportunity uh, to reach a lot of people that way as well. And uh, so you pray for us and pray uh, that the Lord would encourage you and help you, uh, that we could uh, be helped there uh, to get all of that put back together. There's several events that uh, we'll be having this year at the camp and uh, may want to make yourself available. Back to school retreat that we'll be doing for all the young folks. If you'd like to come and be a part of that, that is back there on the table. And then something we started two years ago uh, when we got the camp, we started a men's retreat and uh, bringing men of faith together and giving them a couple days of encouragement and a couple days of fun. And uh, so we bring them together on Friday night and uh, we have a ribeye steak dinner that we feed everybody. Can I get an amen on that? And uh, so we have a full salad bar, have a ribeye steak dinner, all of that. And then uh, that night we'll have a great service singing, preaching around the Word of God. And then we'll go after the service to the gym. And this year we had a cornhole tournament and an axe throwing tournament. And uh, if you've never done axe throwing, uh, I encourage you to try it one time. And uh, so uh, we had a great time with that. And then the next morning, we have a fishing tournament uh, for all the guys that like to get up early, about 6 to 8 o'clock in the morning, and they'll do a fishing tournament. And then we have breakfast, and then we have another service. And then from 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock, we do a shooting competition, which is pistol shooting, skeet shooting, uh, golfing, uh, all of those different things. And then we come back in for lunch and I give out all the awards and all the prizes and things of that nature for everyone that won. So it's a great time of fellowship. Uh, we had the first one the first year we took the camp over and got the camp. And this second year, we doubled what we had the first year, the second year. And so we're looking forward to seeing what God's going to do in that in the days ahead. So that is going to be, that's always February, the last weekend, the 21st, I think the 22nd this year. That information is back there. And I drove from the camp here in about six hours. So uh, coming the back way out of Atlanta, uh, coming up through Chattanooga that way, uh, it wasn't that far. So we've got churches from the 
uh, Tennessee area that come to the camp uh, from Athens, from Iota, different locations that come. And uh, so if you'd like to have that information, that is back there. All the newsletters as well is back there on the table. And uh, if you'll make yourself available to all of those, we'd appreciate it so very much. And you pray for us as we'll head back down uh, the road tomorrow. Mark chapter number five. I want you to go with me for just a few moments. Mark chapter number five. And um, I love this passage of scripture. And uh, I'll, I'll pray and then I'll let you be seated because there's no way you can stand the whole entire uh, the entire scripture because I'm going to deal with that whole chapter. In Mark chapter number five, um, let's pray together and then I'll let you be seated and I'll read some of these verses, okay? Father, we come to you in Jesus' name tonight. God, thank you for the privilege and opportunity to be around your word this evening. Lord, I thank you for safety as we all traveled back to the house of God, keeping us safe in the storms. And Lord, I pray that your will would be accomplished in this place tonight. Lord, I pray you would increase the faith of somebody in this building, God, that they can see great things accomplished in their life in the days ahead. Lord, I pray that you, you said that we should walk by faith and not by sight. So God, I pray that you help us tonight and you touch us and breathe on us. God, help us in the hours of the days ahead to help as many people as possible along this journey. And God, we'll thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen and amen. You can be seated tonight. Mark chapter number five is a very interesting passage of scripture. I call it a miracle upon miracle because it's one miracle right after another miracle right after another miracle. And you come into Mark chapter number five and you find three characters that is mentioned in this passage of scripture. They are three incurable cases which are, humanly speaking, hopeless and impossible. But how many of us recognize and realize that with God, nothing is impossible? Even though they may look incurable, even though they may look hopeless, you let Jesus get on the scene and he always has the ability to turn it around for the glory of God. You find three of these cases. You find the demonic man, you find the diseased woman, and you find the dead girl. In our culture today, these cases and these people would be handled in a different way than what Jesus handled them. The demonic man would have been assigned to a mental ward according to our laws and statutes of today's world. The diseased woman would be assigned to a terminal care unit saying there's no hope for her. The dead girl would have been sent to the morgue to prepare for burial. But Mark 5 records it this way, in the eyes of Jesus, in the feet of Jesus, in the hands of Jesus, in Jesus' ability to take incurable cases of hopelessness and impossibilities and bring miracles and victory. Just in Mark 5, the demonic man now meets the great psychiatrist. The diseased woman now meets the great physician. And the dead girl now meets the great pediatrician. For Jesus always takes the incurable cases and makes something possible out of them. Every one of us inside of this building could have testified just as you did that we were incurable cases in the eyes of man, in the eyes of the circumstances, but Jesus stepped in and changed our circumstances around for his glory. Every time you think about an incurable case, every time you think about an impossibility, every time you think about someone that has gone too far, that is too bad, that is that is gone on beyond the reach of the grace of God. I'm glad Jesus has no limits in his reach and in his ability and the way that he can turn circumstances around for the glory of God. I'm a living testimony to an impossible
possible case that Jesus turned around and every person inside of this building that is saved by the grace of God, you're a living testimony to an incurable case that Jesus set free by his marvelous grace. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was dead, but now I'm alive. I once was blind, but now I can see. Why? Because Jesus loved you and me enough to give everything that we could be changed by the marvelous grace of God. You come into these chapters and you find the man of Gadara. I've been to this location many times. If you go over to Israel and you'll find the Sea of Galilee, there's a Gentile side and there's a Jewish side. And if you go to the Jewish quarter, the Jewish side of the Sea of Galilee, you'll find that's the location where Jesus spent most of his ministry around the Sea of Galilee. Why was that so important? That was their means of transportation in the Lord's day. It was to get on a boat and go from one port to another port to another. And now you come to uh, Bethsaida, you come to all of those ports that are mentioned in Scripture, and that's where Jesus presented and gave most of the gospel and gave most of his life's ministry was around that body of water. But then you say every time the Scripture mentions we're going to the other side. There's a Gentile side to the Sea of Galilee. The Jew had no part of the Gentile side. And so Jesus leaves the Jewish side. He gets on a ship and gets on a boat and he goes across to the other side. And there he meets the man of Gadara, the man that could not be bound, the man that could not be tamed, the man that was out of control, the man that was down in the gutter, so to speak, and was cutting himself night and day. He lived in the graveyard. He was outcast. Nobody had any doings with him and wanted anything to do with him. But Jesus came to the shore of the Gadareans and met this man. That was the man of Gadara. And when this man of Gadara saw Jesus, what did he do? He came to where he was. He fell at his feet and Jesus cast those demons out of him. And where did he cast them? Into the swine. So we know no, according to the word of God, a Jew cannot have anything to do with a swine. So that's the reason we know he's on the other side. He's on the side of the Gadareans. He's on the Gentile side. And you and I better be glad that Jesus left the Jewish quarter, came to the Gentile quarter because he came after man. He came after you. He came after me that we could be redeemed by the grace of God. He comes to this man of Gadara. Now follow this story. As this man of Gadara comes to him, he stops Jesus in his tracks of where he's going. And he meets Jesus and Jesus begins to deal with this man of Gadara. And as he cast those demons out in the swine, they ran off a steep place, fell in the Sea of Galilee and were choked and were drowned by the water. And there they come and they, the crowd and the people of Gadara start coming together. And they find this man of Gadara changed. Not like he used to be. Not what they remember. Not what they thought in their minds. But they saw him clothed, sitting at in, in his right mind, sitting at the feet of Jesus. And everything about him changed. That's exactly Exactly what Jesus knows how to do to incurable cases. He knows how to take the hopelessness and the helplessness and those that are outcasts and he knows how to turn them around for the glory of God. And every person that has been saved by the grace of God, you are a, a champion of grace and of mercy and you are a mark of the goodness of God because Jesus set you free by his grace. Every person here that has been redeemed, we could testify and say, thank you, Lord, that you changed our life. 
Everything about this man was changed. And when the scripture talks about here, Jesus found him. Jesus saved him. Jesus changed him. And the scripture said that Jesus told him, go through the capulous and begin to tell what great things the Lord hath done for thee. And that man began to publish. There's 10 cities along the Isle of Gadara. He begins to go to all of those cities and I could see it in the mindset of Jesus as Jesus sets him free and he begins to walk back to the places that knew him and he begins to testify oh let me tell you what happened let me tell you what Jesus did let me tell you how he changed my life let me tell you how he set me free I'm not the man that I used to be I'm not the dad that I used to be I'm not the husband that I used to be I've been changed and let me tell you what he did and he went through the capitalists and began to publish in those ten cities what Jesus had done for him that should be our responsibility of the church that every day we ought to tell somebody about what Jesus has done for us you know the way to keep your faith alive tell others about it you know the way to keep your faith vibrant tell others about it. You know the way to keep your spirit uh, energized for Christ? Tell others about it. Every day you ought to make sure that you let somebody know that you're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ and let your light shine before men that they can see Jesus inside of you. You come to Mark chapter number 5 and you find the man of Gadara. But then in verses number 22... We come to the woman, the diseased woman that meets the great physician. And you come now to this little lady. Can you imagine? Everything that she has is gone. Her life, her life savings, everything that she has saved throughout her days. The scripture said that she had spent all and nothing battered. And she comes to Jesus and she breaks through the crowd to where he's at. And she heard that Jesus was passing by that way. And she had tried every physician, tried everybody to make her better. She's listened to everybody under the sun, but she heard Jesus was coming to town. And notice what the scripture says. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus, by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. You've got the man of Gadara. You've got Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue. His daughter's dying. Jesus is on the way, coming through the streets, coming through town. He's on his way on a journey to heal Jairus' daughter. And as he is coming through the masses of the crowd, here comes this little woman that needed help from the Lord. Here comes this little woman that had an incurable case. Here comes this little woman that was diseased. Here comes this little woman that had problems for 12 years. And now this little woman breaks through the crowd. Now notice what it says in verse 24. And Jesus went with him, and many and much people followed him and thronged him. Now gather this. If you were in the crowd where Jesus was, his disciples were right there beside of him. There were so many people gathered that have you ever been in a large crowd and it's like a stampede of people? And, and I mean, you're shoulder to shoulder and you're being bumped into on every side because there's so many people. You, you don't know the person beside of you. You don't know the, this one beside of you. But, I mean, you're just bumping into each other because of the throng of people that you're walking through. 
You ever go to a theme park and they open the door at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock in the morning and, and all of those masses of people are standing there. I mean, it's like herding cattle through there. I mean, they're just bumping into each other. They're trying to run to get to the their ride first. They're trying to get to the ticket first, all of those things. And it's just masses of people. That's what it was as Jesus is making his way to Jairus' house. And as Jesus is walking along the streets and no doubt the people had heard and the people had listened and the people had saw the miracles of Jesus and the fame of Jesus has come abroad and now the masses are following him to every place to see what he's going to do next. I love pictures and I, I love visually thinking in my mind how would that have been that day when Jesus is walking to Jairus' house. He just left the man of Gadara. He comes back to the Jewish side and now he's there walking through the streets and Jairus comes running. Oh, my daughter, my daughter, my daughter's nigh to death. Would you please help my daughter? And Jesus, as he's walking, here comes a little woman that had an issue of blood for 12 years. Notice what the scripture tells us. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood for 12 years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all. See, the world would love for you to spend all. The crowd would love for you to spend all. The, the, the flesh would love for you to spend all. She spent everything she had and was nothing better but grew worse. See, trying to turn over a leaf after a leaf just grows worse. It, it doesn't get better. Trying to do it in your own merits doesn't get better. You need a touch from the master's hand. He's the only one that can make it better. Now notice what the scripture says in when she had heard of Jesus, she came in and pressed behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may just touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him. Amen. Dynamite, power, the glory, the touch of God. He knew somebody just touched him. There's a difference from bumping into Jesus and touching Jesus. Amen. There's a difference from just walking alongside of Jesus and me having enough faith to reach out and touch Jesus. She was desperate. She needed help. She was about to die. She had tried everything that the world had to offer in her day. She had tried everything, and the scripture said nothing better in her circumstance and in her life. But then she heard Jesus was coming to town, and she said, maybe, just maybe, if I can just get close enough to him to reach out and touch the hem of his garment. Those Jewish priests would wear their, it was like a cloth that went around them. And on the, on the bottom of those were tassels or hems. It depended upon how, how well up the priest has become to how many tassels, to how many hems that that priest had. And no doubt Jesus is walking in the, in the garments of today, of his culture of that day. And as he's walking, she reaches through the masses. People are thronging him on every side. And as she reaches through, all she can do is muster up enough strength just to reach down and touch the hem, H-I-M, of his garment. And when she touched the hem of his garment, 
everything changed for her. Do you remember the day when you reached out and he touched you and you touched him? Do you remember the hour that you got through the crowd and the masses enough to get to where Jesus was and he turned everything around? I'm talking about the son of the living God. She has virtue and power and ability enough to change every person that will ever come to him. And this little lady comes to where Jesus is and as she breaks through the crowd, she reaches out with all she has and touches the hem of his garment and Jesus stopped immediately. And he asked this profound question to his disciples. I love this. Knowing in himself that virtue, power, in verse 30, but verse 31, and the disciples said unto him, the multitude thronging them, sayest thou, who touched me? In verse 30, 30, who touched my clothes? Jesus asked them. Can you imagine what they were thinking, Lord? Do you understand all of these people are going around you? How are you, how are you asking us who touched you? He said, because somebody just touched me by faith. Somebody just reached out and touched the hem of my garment. Amen. And when she did, virtue, power, that word virtue, dunamis, power, means to come out of him and hit, and the power of the Lord went over to where that woman was and she was changed and made whole, the scripture says. See, you see in this passage several things. Number one, you see her fear. I wonder if I go to Jesus, is he going to be the same as any other person I've been going to? Her symptoms, the issue of blood for 12 years. Her suffering physically, socially, emotionally, financially, her sorrow, she spent all and nothing bettered. But you see her faith. It was a personal faith. She had to reach out and touch him herself. It was a powerful faith because she stopped Jesus in the midst of his tracks. So not only do you have the touch that stopped Jesus, the man of Gadara, now you have Jairus, the touch that stopped Jesus and is bringing Jesus to Jairus' house. But now you have this little woman, the touch that stopped Jesus as she reaches out and touches the hem of his garment. And you find her faith. It was a powerful demonstration because Jesus stopped and said, virtue has gone out, power, dunamis, the power of God has gone from me. Somebody just got healed. Somebody just got saved. Somebody just got changed. Somebody's life has just been rearranged. And the scripture said, when Jesus looked around to see her that had done this thing, he knew who it was before it ever happened. He knew what was about to take place, but those disciples were uh, dumbfounded when he asked the question, who touched me? I wonder today, how many of us ever got desperate enough to touch Jesus? How many of us ever got desperate enough to need the touch of God? How many of us ever got desperate enough that we need the Lord's help in the midst of our circumstance? See, not only was her faith, it was a personal, powerful, it was a profound faith. She was made whole and complete and be whole of thy plague, the scripture says. Amen. The profoundness of her faith, her future, she was cured, she was comforted, for the scripture says that Jesus looked at her and he said, daughter, thy faith had made thee whole, in verse 34, go in peace, and be whole of thy plague. See, her condition was changed. Her situation was turned around. She was made complete. And now she's comforted. Go in peace. Go tell somebody else what Jesus has just done for you. Amen. Every person that's, that's under the sound of my voice tonight 
There's times that we need to get through the masses of the crowd to get to where we can touch Jesus ourselves. Maybe over a son, it may be over a daughter, it may be over a loved one, it may be over a friend, it may be over an acquaintance, it may be over a condition health wise, but you just need to reach out and touch him. I promise you, he's better than ATT. Can I get an amen on that? You can reach out and touch the hem of his garment tonight, and he can change everything about that circumstance in a matter of seconds. What you may, you may struggle over and what you may deal with for years, Jesus can change instantaneously. For the scripture said, what did he say? And immediately. That's power. That's the dunamis of God. That's the Lord working. And I'm glad I know this Jesus. And you know this Jesus. I got to thinking about places in scripture and I won't be long, places in Scripture that, that there was times in the Old Testament and in the New Testament where you saw characters in the Scripture that made a difference by the touch of their hand that stopped the circumstance and stopped God or stopped Jesus in bringing his aid and his rescue. I think about Jacob. When he wrestled with God until he became an a, a individual that walked with a limp. Could you imagine that wrestling match that must have took place that day as he began to wrestle with the Lord? And it was a touch that stopped the Lord on his behalf. You think about not only Jacob, but Moses. When he was walking in the place that he was walking, he saw a burning bush out in the middle of a desert. And the scripture said, The place that thou walkest, take off thy shoes because you are walking on holy ground. And there Moses had an encounter with the Son of God and with the Lord himself. And there he saw the burning bush. A touch that stopped Jesus. Daniel in the lion's den cradled up against those lions and, and they threw him in there to try to devour him and trying to silence him and trying to stop him. But the next morning they find him laying on the breast of the lion as a pillar because the, in the middle of that lion's den he had met with the God of this universe and God was there to protect him. A touch that stopped Jesus. You think about the three Hebrew boys as they're in the fiery furnace and Nebuchadnezzar looks down the hosen of that. They heated it up seven times hotter than it's ever been and those boys are down in the midst of that fire bound with what the, the world had placed on them. But in the midst of that fiery furnace, Nebuchadnezzar looks down the hosen of that great shaft and looks in there and he begins to question how many did we throw inside the fiery furnace? And he says, I thought we just threw three, but the form of the fourth looks like the Son of God. And those three Hebrew boys are down there in the midst of the fiery furnace having camp meeting with the Son of God and fellowshipping with Jesus himself. And they come out and they don't even smell like smoke. That's incurable cases. That's impossibilities. But Jesus gets on the scene and it's a touch that stopped Jesus and changed the outcome of the story and the outcome of the circumstance. Peter saw him and out on the Sea of Galilee and he saw Jesus walking on the water and he said, bid me to come and, G and Peter gets out of the boat he didn't get out when it's calm. He got out when the storm was raging. He got out of the boat and he started walking to where Jesus was. You say, well, he didn't get far. He got farther than you. Can I get an amen on that? Huh? He gets out of the boat. He starts walking to where Jesus is. He starts to look at the storms and the circumstances instead of keeping his eyes on the Son of God. And any time that we get in the midst of problems, if we get our eyes on the circumstances rather than on Jesus, we'll begin to sink as well. And here 
he started to sink and he said, Lord, please help me. And Jesus reached down and grabbed him. Guess what they did? They walked back to the boat on the water. Amen. Huh? And they're amazed that even the seas and the winds and the water would obey the will of the master. I'm telling you, it's touches like that that stop Jesus, and Jesus comes to our aid and our rescue. The thief met him on the cross and was saved. A touch that stopped Jesus. Saul encountered him on the Damascus Road in Acts chapter number 9. And he's going to persecute more believers. Going to cause havoc to the church of the living God. But Jesus shone that great light. The light of himself down in front of, of Saul. And there he became the apostle Paul. Saved by the grace of God. One of the greatest New Testament Christians ever known to mankind. Why? Because it was a touch that stopped Jesus. That's what we need in America. That's what we need in our country. That's what we need in our churches. People that will reach out and touch him and say, we need your presence in this place that you can change lives and you can change hearts. That's what people need, an encounter with Jesus. They may encounter you. They may encounter me, but the person they need to encounter is the Son of God. I may let them down and I will. You may let them down and you will, but Jesus will never Amen. let them down. Amen. That's the reason everything we do ought to be to promote Jesus, ought to be to put a picture of Christ Ought to be to shine the light to the gospel. Shine the light to Jesus. It is not your ministry. It is not my ministry. It's the Lord's. He just led us here for a little while. Just lent it to us to serve him, to be the hands and feet of Jesus on this side of eternity, to point men and women to the cross of Christ that they can be saved by the grace of God. And may I and may you and may we be a part of stopping Jesus to get him to pass by and get him to come to these locations and begin to change the hearts and lives of people in these last days. Amen. A touch that stopped Jesus. There's a difference from walking around him, bumping into him, and reaching out and touching him. I want to touch him. Amen. I want to see what he can do. Because I know I haven't even seen a thimble full of what my master can do. Neither have you. If we would just reach out and touch him. May God help us at Temple Baptist Church to be a church in these last days. Don't lose heart. Don't get weary and well doing. Don't quit right before Jesus comes. Keep on the fire in line, but reach out and touch him and say, Lord, we need your presence more than any other time that we have ever been alive inside of your house. That your name could be magnified. That people could see Christ. That people could see their lives changed. If I didn't believe that Jesus could do what he did in Mark chapter number five now, I'd go sit at the house. Huh? Yeah. He's still the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Right. He's just looking for some people like that little woman, like Jairus. If you read on the passage of Scripture on to the end, you find the demonic man is changed. You find the diseased woman is changed. And you find now the dead girl is changed because Jesus walks into the house and he takes his disciples and he goes to that upper room where they have her laying and he brings that mother and father in. And in Jewish culture, that's why the servant come running to, the, to Jairus on his way with Jesus and said, don't bother the master anymore. She's gone. But what did Jesus do? He kept walking. 
Huh? Aren't you glad he keeps walking? Huh? Think about it. He kept walking. He didn't look at, listen to the, uh, to the words of the servant. He kept walking. He knew what was about to happen. He knew the miracles that was about to take place. He knew the resurrection and the life was walking down the street, coming to the house where Jairus' daughter's at. He knew something big was about to take place. And he brought that little family inside of her, inside of her room. And he took the little hand of that little girl and he gave life back to that girl. And he put the hand of that little girl in the hand of his mom and her mom and dad. And guess what they did? They walked out of the house together. Proof. In Jewish culture, they have a big thronging of people. They call them professional mourners. Yeah. And when a, when, a, when a burial takes place, they bury them very quick over there. And it's not like a ceremony like ours that we have here. And they have all of these mourners that's coming alongside of them. So when Jairus' servant come to him, he was coming with those mourners saying, don't bother the master, it's over. She's gone. Everything, there is, is no hope whatsoever. As Jesus keeps walking the resurrection and the life, all of those professional mourners are coming with him to the house. That's the reason he said, everybody else stay outside. Let me take the little mama and the little daddy and a couple of the disciples up into the upper room where she's at and he gives life and when she walks out beside of the mom, beside of the dad and beside of the master all of those mourners were in amazement of the presence of the living lamb that had just given life back to a dead girl. I'm telling you, he has the power the, the authority and the ability to take impossible cases and turn them around for the glory of God so don't lose heart. Don't lose hope. Don't say that he can't do it because I serve a God that still can, hallelujah, turn the circumstances around for the glory of God. Amen. Every person here has and will have impossible cases. You just need to reach out and touch him and watch what he can do when he turns it around. And you know what happens every time? After that happens, you find the masses giving glory to God. Amen. It's a cycle. We watch him, we see him work, and then we see the miracle of what he does, and then we turn by faith and give glory to the Lamb of God. Because without him, we would see nothing, experience nothing, be a part of nothing. But now he's given life to everything we have. Why? Because he loves us with an everlasting love. Amen. I want to say to this church, I, I love you. I appreciate you. And as an evangelist, I'm supposed to be a second witness to the preacher. I hope that we've done that today. Everything that he's preaching, I've just said amen to. Amen. It's just been a second witness, a second voice to that, to say, hey, look and see. Jesus can still do something. Jesus can still work. Jesus can still change lives. The reason you're on television, the reason uh, you said today that people in Germany and different locations around the world got online to watch is so the gospel could go forward and the gospel could be preached and the gospel could be magnified and Jesus could be honored and exalted. What an opportunity for the church to be alive in these last days to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And may that be the challenge of our heart that we want to see people touched by the Lamb of God. Because we've experienced His touch, we want somebody else to experience His touch. You know the old saying is still true that every time you get the honor and the privilege to talk to somebody about Jesus, and you may get to lead them to the Lord, it's like getting saved all over again. 
because it brings you back to the place you were at when he found you and when he changed your life. That's the reason I love the work of God. I thank God that he lets us be a part of his great big business because I'm not worthy of it, of it neither are you, but I appreciate the opportunity to serve my master because I know what he's done for me. And I challenge you, go away from this place, not being a casualty of summer, just, just throwing church on the side road, but be something for God during this summer season. Be an example to your family, your friends, your acquaintances, those around you. And let your light shine. And let them see that you've been touched by the Master. And it would create a hunger in them that they want what you have on the inside. Because there's a lot of people looking. There's a lot of people searching. And there's a lot of people hungry for what you have. And we have the greatest story that could ever be told, the gospel, the power of God, the dunamis, the virtue. Just what he did for these three, he's done for us, and he can do for them. May that be our challenge tonight. Father, thank you for our time together. Lord, thank you for this congregation. Pastor Charles, Miss Linda, God, thank you for them. And I pray you bless us tonight and help us, Lord, to be instruments of your will and of your work and of your way and of your power. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for all your blessings that you've bestowed upon us. Lord, may we, may we do with what you give us to honor your name. And Lord, I pray that Jesus would be magnified in all that we do. Lord, we thank you again for the opportunity to be here at Temple this day. God bless them. Continue to help them. I've seen their Bible schools coming up. God bless that in the days ahead. Lord, let them reach a lot of young folks. Let them reach a lot of their children. And let them reach a lot of teens in the upcoming days. And Lord, we'll thank you for all that you do. Help us as we labor together to be servants of Christ. And God will give you the praise for it. Thank you, Lord, for passing by our way. Thank you, Lord, for changing our lives. Thank you, Lord, one day when I was 16 years old, I came to the end of my road, and you let me reach out and touch you as you touched me. And, Lord, I thank you for changing my life. Lord, I've never been the same since the hour, the day that you came in. And Lord, I pray that you just give us a greater desire, a greater hunger, a greater motivation, a greater thirst to do more for you in these days. And we'll give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Let's stand all over the building. They're going to sing one verse of invitation. And uh, maybe you would just like to come this way tonight and just thank Jesus that he passed by you and changed your life. How long has it been since we just thank the Lord for his goodness and his mercy and his grace? How long has it been since we just gave a few moments of time and just said, thank you, Lord? You didn't have to, but you did. You came to where I was at and you kept walking the resurrection and the life toward me that was dead and gave me life and gave it to me more abundantly. Maybe you'd like to come and thank him as they sing tonight. You just mind the Lord.
that's good preaching. That has always intrigued me where the Lord said, who touched me? I suppose that uh, you might uh, be able to say that he knew why everyone bumped against him, why every hand might have touched him. He knew why, but only one hand out of that whole bunch touched him in faith to receive something from him. Amen. And the Bible says without it, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith. The 11th chapter of Hebrews is something to look at. Read it, pray over it, and uh, learn the lessons of it for the names that are in there and the names that are not in there. It's quite a thing. Amen. Thank you, brother. He's ministered the scriptures to us today. He's done some good preaching. This is the kind of old-fashioned preaching that people understand. Amen. Yes, it's, they understand this. And, uh, and so many people come in here and they say, we just don't hear preaching like that anymore. And that's such a shame. They don't. But it tells you, too, also that, that uh, even the younger generations coming on, they're not, they're not fools. They're no fools. They can really tell a difference if there's something different about the preaching than what they normally hear. Amen. You don't need to come to church to be told how good you are. You get it out there all the time. So you come in here, you want to hear the truth, don't you? Amen. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, brother. Let's have a couple of men go to the back door and we'll take up an offering for, serve, for this brother here. And we appreciate his ministry. We appreciate his wife. And uh, I mean, he's on the road all the time. And that's a, that's a tough job. It really is. Um, each ministry it has its own uh, problems. For example, Sean uh, I admire tonight in Haiti. I've been doing a lot of praying for him ever since that young lady and uh, her husband were murdered uh, I've been praying for him, and I haven't heard anything the last couple of days, but please pray for him. Pray for Sean. They don't come any better than him. He loves what he's doing, and he loves the Lord, and he loves those uh, those people in Haiti that he's ministering to. He moved down there and moved in with them, and he's carrying the Word of God, and it's on his heart. You can tell he's living He's living where he needs to be. The call of God's on his life, and uh, that'll overcome anything, any, any of the obstacles that may come his way. So call his name out tonight, Sean Eidmeyer, and ask the good Lord to protect him, bless him, and uh, pray for this too. Uh, in my estimation, Haiti needs leadership in the worst way. They need leadership and build that country and do what has to be done for those people. Those people are suffering. It's sad that the thousands that have died, they're hungry, they hurt. And these gangs are fighting for power because there is no power and there is no authority. And this is what happens when a vacuum uh, comes in. So please pray for those folks in Haiti. And they're turning to voodoo. A lot of them are. And they're doing that because uh, uh, that's the only thing they have. If they only had the gospel of Christ. I don't know how many of them have heard it. I have no idea. But uh, pray for them. Amen. All right. Let's have prayer. We'll let you go. Meet again Wednesday night. Looks like the storm's blown by. That's good. Father, thank you, Lord, for your man, for the word of God, for his faithfulness to preach it, for his faithfulness, Lord, to serve in the field that you've put him, to do what you've called him to do. And, Father, the gifts that you've given him, to be able to do that. And, our Father, I pray for him. I pray you bless him, bless his efforts. Lord, bless them financially and spiritually in every way that they need to be. In your holy name, amen. God bless you, folks.